Stories, learning. The big confusion about that. Always stories. Always stories. Rabbi. Always stories. Can I just say that at the beginning of the year, all the Hazrayan things really irritated me, but now I really vibe with it. So thank you. Because life is one big fabreng, and that's really one. Yeah, let's learn a little bit and then maybe I'll tell you some stories. It's a little hard not to say stories. Rabbi, uh, yeah. To start off the Fabrang and to go on topic of the day, what is the most influential lesson you learned from your father? We'll get to that in a few minutes. I'll, I'll, I just want to make sure that I learned something first before I, because once I open up the pipeline, it doesn't shut. Allah Yud Beis, Kuf Chaf. Kala we're on page 120. So we're about cashing vessels. Kala Amor who rakli min achshar is klezu chukis mishari is for pashering glass from other resorts, meaning for year-round usage. Aval kvarnis bush yeshmerim shein nachshar klezu chukis le pesach afil leif and zeh. With regards to kashering glass for pesach, we're even more stringent, more strict, and uh, the custom is not to do that, even though some svarim still do it. Amram kasher ein klezu chukis mitzuyim in the case of the pesach, someone has no choice. You have no other vessels to use. The persons have limited, you know, whatever choices and the like. Then vessels like cups that you didn't use for hot, that's either just use like wine glasses, they're only used for cold. You can pasture them by filling them with the, to the brim for a 24 hour cycle, dumping out the water and doing that three times. That's called a cold kashering process. What about uh, porcelain and pyrex? Halacha did gimel, kli harsina, which is porcelain, vichin kadeus emel, which is covered metal. Nistapko, paskim shemadinam, kikli chedes. The poskim are not sure. Maybe it has the same thing as a klicheres, and we don't kasha them. But when you have a case of loss, she has a shayla. Clay pyrex, pyrex is a type of a glass. The stopkum and poskim of dinner klicheres a chuchis. It doesn't have the din of glass or not. She has a shayla. I think a lot of people do hold it as a din of glass. What page are you at? Page kuf chaf one twenty. We're on halacha yudalid now. Besides the difference between the type of material the vessel is made from, between the, the appearance of the vessel, so we look at how the vessel is used. We have a vessel that's only used in a cold application. We can kosherize it in a cold application. We have a vessel that's only used with hot water. We can kosherize it with boiling hot water. We have a vessel that's used directly on the fire. For example, a barbecue grate. That has to be kashered with fire, live fire mamish. So the way in which something gets absorbed, that's how it gets purged. It's called the light to light principle. It's a very fundamental principle. So, libun hagola v'adacha b'mayim, which is kashim with fire, boiling water, and rinsing. Aklalu kibel kachpoto, the way it gets absorbed, that's what gets purged. Hechshu kederch shimush alakli. The kashim of the vessel is the way in which a vessel is used. Allah chatez vav lachein klisha shimushay de yesh mamish the later eight of a mayim. A vessel that's used only with direct fire, for example, a barbecue spit, a barbecue grill, the grate. There's no liquid medium there. It's direct fire to the contact of the food, right? To make the steak or to make your hamburgers, whatever food that uh, you find uh, your choice. So then it's direct, it's direct absorption. Those have to be cashed with live fire itself and it's to get red hot. It actually has to get white. When I call libon, it's called white. Libon means, comes from the term of white. So there's, there's libon gomer and libon kal. Liban Chomer means a very hot fire is a, is a temperature of about 850 or 900 degrees. So when you put an oven on self, a real self-cleaning system, not, a, not a, just a cleaning system, but a real self-cleaning system, the oven will get up to like 900 degrees. You have to pull the oven away from the wall to air it out, and the oven locks. It's a whole system. <laughs> Or you put live coals directly on the, on the grate. Only through that can you actually kosherize the uh, the fire, <laughs> the, the isu that's absorbed in the in the kli. In is called a But when it comes to kosherizing a vessel, you can kosherize the vessel in stages. I can kosherize. This is a large vessel. Let's say I have a, a plate. 
that's this large, it's a metal plate or a metal brazier. Brazier is a very thick piece of metal that they fry on. It's used in commercial kitchens. So I can kosherize this part of the brazier with coals. If I, if I don't want to have so much intense heat all at once, I can decide I'm doing it in thirds. I'm doing a third of the brazier with coals. I'm waiting for that to cool down. Then I'm going to move it to the middle of the brazier and I'm going to do the other third. So I'm a lot of kosherizing stages. When it comes to tevila of a vessel, it's different. You have to have the entire vessel. It has to be in a total immersion to be able to become purified. When it comes to kosherizing the vessel, where we're burning whatever's absorbed inside with fire, we can do so in stages. It's a different, different application of a different principle. So even if you only use half a vessel, you still have to kosherize the whole vessel. Now those that say that after kosherizing a vessel, you're supposed to give it a cold rinse. Now halacha tazayin gets into liban kalvin. I'll try to tell you a story. Um, one more halacha. So tazayin says it's called liban kal. Liban kal is a lower form of, of a fire application, which really mimics the same the same effect as boiling water. Let me just explain this in in, uh, in more simple terms. If I have a pot that's used normally, it's, I boil water in there. So I use the pot, let's say, um, and I cooked up non-kosher chicken soup in the pot. So now the walls of this pot absorbed non-kosher meat, or chicken in this case, and it was absorbed through the medium of liquid, right? Because the fire heated up the liquid that went into the vessel. The liquid was what actually got absorbed. So in order to purge that taste that's in the vessel, I need to boil water in the vessel I wait 24 hours, don't use it first, and then I boil water in the vessel and let the water pull out that taste. That's the classical way, that's kashmir with hagala. I can also kosherize that same vessel by using fire, by putting fire, that's either coals or putting a flame directly shooting into the middle of the vessel. Let's say I have a pot, I turn it upside down over a burning flame, and I let it sit there until smoke starts coming out the outer side of the vessel. It doesn't have to get red hot, red hot inside. Just has to get too hot. Where if I put a piece of tissue, it would burn on the outer side, or gets you know, it's, it's so it's that's called a leaven call. That's a form of fire, but it's less intense type of a heat that you would have in a barbecue, where it has to be mamish red hot at 900 degrees. So leaven call is typically about 500 degrees, whereas leaven gomor is about 900 degrees. So anytime where you can kasha something with hagala, you can also do leaven call, which is a lighter form of fire. I'm going to share with you another principle which is very fascinating in Jewish life. When you have a shaila, we make, people make mistakes so something happens in the kitchen un, unexpected. So if, for example, a vessel absorbs non-kosher, so someone put non-kosher food, meat or chicken, into my vessel and cooked it, then I have to kosherize the vessel full throttle. If on the other end, if I have a kosher vessel, let's say it's a kosher meat pot, and by mistake, somebody boiled milk in there, but not at the same time as me. The pot was clean. So now I still have to kosherize the vessel because now my vessel got absorbed with meat and milk, which is a problem. But because the milk and the meat did not go in simultaneously, yes? So now, Halacha says, I'm allowed to kosherize the vessel in a bit of a lighter way from the way it was absorbed and, and leave over a small remnant of taste because the small remnant of taste will be too weak to be able to create a new entity as Basu B'chalav. Because Basu B'chalav is only prohibited when, you, when they form together, they bond and they, create a, they have a creation. But if it's too weak of an entity, it's not gonna be able to do that. It's not gonna have the power. So there's, a, there's two concepts in halacha known as hetetabal, if it's absorbed as permissible material, meaning the milk and the meat did not go in together. It never became bas b'chalav yet. So then I'm allowed to leave a weak taste still in. So if I have a pot that absorbed, let's say I, I boiled milk inside, and it's a meat pot, I did it at a separate time from the meat. I can kosherize that pot by pouring boiling water into the pot. I don't actually have to boil water in the pot. I can have a less intense form of kosherization, even though that's going to uh, net result, there will be a small taste of the milk that's still inside the pot, but that small taste will not be strong enough to create a new identity as Basim Khalaf. It's a concept in Allah. That's why whenever there's a Shiloh, we want to know what happened. Just had a Shiloh from a woman. She took a pizza maker. I don't know if it was her, someone in the family took a pizza maker, the milk took a pizza maker, and they by mistake cut onions with a flashing knife, 
and it's a sharp food, so there's an absorption there. And he took those onions and made a parv dish on the pizza maker. So I said to him, was the pizza maker clean? Because if it was not clean, if there was cheese on it, that means the cheese and the onions bonded and created a problem right there. If it was not, if it was clean, then I just have to worry about the absorption, which is less severe. She wasn't sure anyway. The rough told me, I asked a friend of mine, the rough, we can be linked and we can kosherize it. Because the kosherize the pizza maker is not so simple. We can turn it on for, for half an hour at the highest setting. Because it didn't get absorbed with the milk and the meat together. So it's the same principle we're talking about here. <laughs> it, was, it, was a, it was a permissible taste, meaning the milk and the meat went in separately. So now we turn the page, the way of Kashmir, we put a string or we put some tissue on the outside of the vessel. We put coals inside, actually, it's sort of a kashe yachoyim, it still burns. Meaning, it gets hot enough that a piece of tissue would burn on the outer side. It starts to brown, then you know it's hot enough. It doesn't mean red hot, it just means there's a certain level of temperature. This type of temperature doesn't actually burn the iser. When you have something like a barbecue where it's red hot, 900 degrees, it burns the iser at its place. But Levin Kal extracts the iser. It's a different application, a different kind of effect. And the minute is that after you do Levin Kal, that you should rinse the keli with cold water. Now, let's uh, take a pause. We're up to Halacha Yud Zayin. What did I learn from my father? Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. Good question. My father, his name was Yaakov and Yitzchak. My, I'm named after my father's father. My father was, it was Svardim, so I was named after my grandfather during his lifetime. Yeah. So when, they, when I went to my grandfather's shul, they would say, Ya'amod Yitzchak ben Yaakov. And my, fa- my grandfather was named after his father. It's, it goes generational. <laughs> So I wouldn't move because they're calling up my grandfather. I would look to see if he moved before I moved. Anyway, it's just a, a little <laughs> bit of a Sephardic experience there. Um, my father was a, um, was a unique individual, but what I would learn from him, I would say, I learned two things from him that are that outstand, outstanding. Number one, he was, he was absolutely like obsessed with the rabbi. He would think about the Rebbe, think about what the Rebbe wants, but not in a, not an extreme way. Not like he was very balanced, but he was just so connected with the Rebbe, which was, was which was just amazing. He just was always dreaming about what he could do for the Rebbe, Chabad, and, and asking himself, that, am I doing what the Rebbe wants? Just really, and he loved to learn Torah. But when it comes to Chinuch, he was very unique. He, he had an approach where he believed anything is possible. As a scientist, he had to try projects, experiments, and have a lot of patience. He, had, he was a, a physicist, a solar energy expert in solar energy. The Rebbe told him to do this, to go into this industry. He ended up um, achieving 57 patents in the world of solar uh, cells and solar energy and all that, and um, a lot of intellectual property that he, uh, he was responsible for. A few, I think two patents actually published after he passed away. He worked on things to the last moment. But he was very, um, he was just fearless in terms of his belief. He believed anything is possible. So he was not, you know, he could sometimes get a little discouraged because we have setbacks. You know, he tried projects, they didn't work. But he would always look at the positive and say, if this doesn't work, something else is going to work. And he would propel himself forward and he gave that to us. So he, he, as children, growing up in the house, um, he had a very staunch belief in us. And he gave us the feeling we could do whatever we put our mind to. Nothing is important. We could do whatever we need to. And every child needs a certain kind of love from their parents. They need certain support and unique support. Every child is different. So he found in each child what, what they needed. And he, he had a way of just uh, giving them what they needed <laughs> and believing in them. Um, and um, I'm, I'm very grateful because it, it made a strong impact on my life. It helped me really shaped the trajectory of my life and he guided me in my work also. And he told me, his words to me were, stay out of politics and become an expert in your industry. Yeah. It was very succinct, you know, he didn't, uh, didn't mince words. And, um, and, and um, but he was very real also. He was like, very humble, very real, just 
It's very down to earth. So he, he said, they interviewed him about the, uh, the Shabbatons, the Lubavitch, the Pegishas. He started the Pegishas, the weekends in 1962, which are going on to this very day. In fact, at the end of his life, he saw the Shabbaton for college students. Or I think it was, it was a C-Teen Shabbaton or one of those. He went, he attended one like a few months before he passed away. There were 800 kids. C-Teen, I think it was. He was so taken. He says, I can't believe I'm, I'm experiencing watching 800 kids come to the rabbi. He was, he was out of, it was tremendous. But anyway, he, so someone had asked him, they asked him and Rabbi Beryl Baumgarten of Blessed Memory. Uh, they, they used to do the Pegishas together. Rabbi Baumgarten was older than my father. But they asked him, what's your secret of success? Bringing people to the rabbi and making them, helping them you know, adopt a religious lifestyle and, and uh, be observant Jews. So Rabbi Baumgarten says, we just tell them the truth. Like straight up, you know, like straight up, we just tell them the truth. And uh, there was no, no pretentiousness, just, just straight up. Um, and um, what else can I tell you? He was, um, yeah, he was very supportive of all of us. He really he was very good to all of us. He, he, you know, we knew, we knew what he wanted from us. We knew what he wanted uh, to give him in terms of bachas, in terms of, but at the same time, he was very supportive of all of us. And we all had our things we had to learn how to grow from, you know, it's part of growing up. And uh, he was really very strong in terms of being there for us and um, kind of set the tone for that. Yeah. Yeah. And he was, very humorous and uh, he was very good with children. He did, there was no age barrier. He would learn from anybody he could. Because his background in Torah was more limited. He was a very smart man. He learned the Mara, he learned seven, eight receptors. But his, just to just, just uh, say, in terms of his academically, he didn't really have that much background in the Mara. So when he was visiting my sister in Alabama, he would ask a yeshiva about a 14 year old boy to study Gemara with him, to teach him Gemara. The boy was like, Dr. Anoka, I, I don't really feel qualified to teach you the Mara. He said, what do you, what's the problem? You, you know more, you know more, more than I do. I want to learn from you. And there was just never any sense of, of, of separation. It was just connection. And he would, he would sometimes ask a question that Tracer's asked, one of the commentators in the Gemara asked my father, and he would, um, he was just very humble. He was extremely humble. I told you last week, the Rebbe criticized him for being too humble. So, um, but he was just, it was just, uh, he was just like a conduit. He was like, you know, straight into the point. And, uh, and he also liked to say, he would say, he would get, he would get very warm. The Rebbe sent, the Rebbe sent us to Boston. My father was working in university, in, in, in industry in, in uh, Tarrytown, New York. We lived in Muncie at the time. But then he had a job change, so he had to go to Boston. Boston is known as the Athens of America because you have MIT and Harvard, you have all the prestigious universities. The Athens meaning Chachmas Agoyim, Greek uh, philosophy and all that stuff. So in the middle of a chassidish of our last name is Hanukkah. My father would say, the Rebbe sent Hanukkah to Yavon, to Greece. <laughs> Hanukkah to, you know, to light up, to, to, bring, to bring light into to, to Greece, the light of Hanukkah. He had just a way of, of encapsulating things and uh, you used to also say that at the middle of a and you say L'chaim, you get a lube job, just like you bring your car in and you get, they change all the fluids of the vehicle. It's called a lube job, lubrication job. So a Lubavitch job, but if a is a lube job, it just cleans all the system. L'chaim cleans you out and gets you fired up again. And uh, it's called a lube job, just to say. And um, yeah, he was just a... Uh, Purim, you know, I told you to do Purim, right? I told you to see. So the Boston and Ever in Boston, he used to have a Purim Suda for the whole town, the community. About a thousand people would come there. He went out to Brookline High School. My father was a doctor, PhD. And in Boston, you have a lot of professionals. And even the, the other people that were religious, the Nalabavich, they, they really respected professionals, you know, Dr. So and so, or this, whatever, a lawyer. And and my father was a, a doctor, a chassid, but he was a chassid and he was a thoroughbred chassid. And he didn't, you know, so he broke all stereotypes. He wasn't like a cold fish. He was a warm chassid. So he used to come in on Purim. He said, Lachaim, he took a dish towel with a gatl over his head. He was already, you know, on his Purim. He'd come into the suda and the Muslim, and he'd start dancing on the tables. 
the people in Boston, they were they just couldn't believe it. Dr. Loka is dancing on the tables. And that. He broke stereotypes. He just he, so he broke through. He brought a lot of a lot of light into uh, to various places. Um, various places. He, uh, yeah, you know the story was with peace. You know the story with the peace that the there was uh, there was a time in Boston there was some uh, some discord going on amongst various uh, organizations. Anyway, they sent a shliach to try and make peace between the parties. The Rebbe told his secretary, Rabbi Chadikov, I think and Rabbi Chadikov told the messenger that before, this is from the Rebbe, before you meet with the parties to make peace, you first have to speak to Dr. Hanoka to find out what's really happening in town. Because he had that, you know, he had that, he had that vision of what's really, it's really right. Um, anyway. What are some funny stories he told you, like questions people asked him? So I'm assuming doing like when when my father came from, he asked the Rebbe very fundamental questions. He, he couldn't get used to the idea that a Jewish soul is higher, and more more special in a way than a non-Jewish soul because it's a part of God. So he asked very fundamental questions. So Rabbi Mangel, God bless him, was assigned to talk to him about these things and help him with these things. I think my father asked very very fundamental, very uh, those kind of questions. Um, but once he got over that, he was very like, connected. He was very like, clicked in. Um, he also, the Rebbe told him to make a Kiddush Hashem in his workplace. And he, he did. He worked very hard. He was very honest. And also, he was, he was like a father figure to the people there. They all respected him. So he didn't have to be religious by, by being different. He was religious because he was different. He didn't have to act different. He was, he was, it was different. But it was different in a special way. He was still very connected with his colleagues and they would ask him for guidance and, uh, and all that. And he always had a picture of the Rebbe on his desk and a pushka. But he, you know, he asked his mashpia once, he said, you know, I'm not supposed to think about science on Shabbos. On Shabbos, you're supposed to dedicate your time to the study of Torah. So he said to his, his, his mashpia, he says, but I can't really help it because my mind is constantly churning and constantly thinking of ideas creative thinking, creative juices. What should I do? So his mashpia said to him, your science is taida. Because the Rebbe told him to be a scientist, he used it you know, to spread the Rebbe Shita on the world, age of the world. And as according to, according to taida, it doesn't mean he should have, you know, so to speak, focus on it. But if he, if he thought about it on Shabbos, it wasn't a, wasn't a concern. And uh, he also was very courageous. He would dive into any new subject he wanted to. He was interested in geology, the age of the world. So he used to go to the, 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 uh, the college library, like with Harvard, I might get a class at the MIT library. He would take out these massive books. He had books stacked this high. I mean, he would read, his mind was like, he uh, was just like absorbed in things. So we used to, my brother and I, my brother's very humorous, he used to pretend like, you know, we, we knew the scientific terms, hydrogen passivation, you know, he would just throw these terms out to sound like we knew what was going on, we didn't know what was going on, but, but uh, he was a very, um, had a very curious mind and a very patient mind, my father also. When I studied with him, we would never go further unless we fully understood the subject matter at hand. We could learn one or two lines of Gemara, but he would understand, he would dissect everything. That's, that was his, uh, was his style. Anyway, it's a Shabbat Shalom Aliyah, and Shtorm um, Lamayla, we should come back to Mashiach, Yaakov and Yitzchak. And um, he's playing, he's definitely pulling strings upstairs, but we need the real, the real, the real trick. My father was a magician, we need the real trick. From Mashiach, you know, to bring out the real tricks. Anyway, Shabbos. So you got your answer? Okay, good enough. Yeah. Are you related to God? Am I related to? The Nokos from Pasadena, I'm related. There's a Nokos from Pasadena. I didn't know that's his name. It's Lucham? 